Wow. Thanks. Everyone came. Yeah. Thank you. Whoa, they're up there too. <laughs> and since it's an opera house, allow me. You know. <laughs> well, Doug covered most of the terrain that I was going to get into, so uh, I'm all out of questions. Um, we'll go right to the Q and A. Go right to the aria. <laughs> uh, you actually didn't begin reading or writing in less by force. Through all the way, mostly through college. That's so, correct. Yeah, yeah. And you ended up being a writer. It's interesting. It's hope for everyone, especially who have yeah. children who are not uh, currently engaging in the process of making sentences. Uh, they might be bestsellers at some point. But how did you, through copywriting, which you also despise doing, and uh, writing co uh, writing press releases? for the San Francisco Zoo. Right. Living next to the uh, gorilla house must have been kind of like being <coughs> next to a marine barracks. Did you, did you spend well, a lot of time there? It was a little smelly. It was a little <laughs> smelly. But I liked, I liked uh, having an office, first of all, in a construction trailer. It was kind of, you know, I'm not the corporate type, so that was kind of nice. Mm -hmm. And every now and then people would knock on the door and open it and go, is this gorilla world? Because the signs would all <laughs> point that way. And, and I'd go, kind of. <laughs> Not quite, uh, but uh, I but I, I actually really loved writing uh, writing uh, the stories. What I wasn't good at was the um, the answer the, taking the media calls mm -hmm. because the the uh, you know you get the call like I, the one uh, that Doug mentioned that um, there was a rumor that the, the cheetah was sucked dry by fleas and I got that call and of course what you should do as a good public relations person is deny quickly and I was fascinated. I was like, wait a minute, how many? <laughs> how much blood per flea? How many fleas would that take? How much blood in a cheetah? Is this actually possible? And I'm getting into it with the reporter, and it's my boss is like, what are you doing? Just, no, it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Deny it. So I didn't, I didn't last long in uh, public relations. <laughs> I can imagine that. Uh, and you're, of all things, your, your first book was called Stiff. Yes. You went right for a, a single word slang uh, yeah. based off of what was initially two s small pieces S two for salon. Two small pieces, yep. Right? Yep. About the explosive nature of a Thanksgiving stomach. Yes. Potentially. But they Potent were using cadavers. They were using Those cadavers. And you know what? That's, that was, a, that was a, a, a poorly designed study because uh, if you use a cadaver, uh, a, I'm probably going way into too much detail here about uh, this, but okay. So, so if you um, okay, if you eat, if you overeat, uh, if you really overeat tremendously, uh, the, it comes to a point where your stomach stretches to the point where it might burst. You reflexively throw up. You have a reflex to throw up, and that saves your life. Uh, and if you're dead, though, you don't have that reflex. So the whole premise of this 1800 study, but I loved it because they sat the cadaver at a table. <laughs> Like poured it in, and I'm like, that's my kind of science. Yeah. So. When they ask you to donate your body, you really have to think everything through. <laughs> All right. you never know where you'll end up. And yeah, and you ended up at the body farm. Uh, yes, I spent some time at the body farm. I didn't. End, I mean, I haven't. I'm not donating. No, no. I, well, I'm not. Although not you know, I, I, people write to me saying, uh, I, you know, I read your book and I'd really like to donate myself to the body farm. And no one, nothing else in that book does anybody say, I'd really like to donate myself to automotive safety or anatomy. I'd like to you know, help educate medical students. The gorilla like, no. house. The gorilla house. They, they're like, no, I want to go rot in a field in Knoxville, Tennessee. I don't, I don't understand that. But I um, always have to mention that you. Uh, Do you have a number you, you refer them to? You know, 1 800 smelly. Yeah. Um, they, they would have to uh, get themselves there. The body farm doesn't pay your transit all the way from out of state, which is very disappointing for these people. <laughs> Who are these It's people? a whole other thing to worry about. Yeah. When <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. How will did, I get there when I'm dead? Did, they did a study on corpses driving. <laughs> yeah, right. at some point. Combine that with your crash test dummy uh, piece, which also led to stiff. Yeah, right. And you got something. Um, did you have any out-of-body experiences when you were there? Like, can you imagine yourself in that place? Like, hmm. In the body this could farm. Be me, yeah. uh, no, but the, not there. But the first place that I went when I wrote Stiff was this, the, this plastic surgery 
practice lab, basically, where there were uh, 40 uh, heads in a um, they put them in roasting pans because the head is sort of the same size as a roaster chicken. And they're delicious. And, and, and yes, mm. pro, yeah, I wouldn't know, but yeah. if you say so. They would put them Spend in. Spend some time on an island. <laughs> They would put them in. A, they would put them in these pans anyway. Uh, so I spent time that and it was a fascinating afternoon. But then on the plane home, I'm looking around at my fellow passengers and I'm thinking, I know what you'd look like as just a head. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little disconcerting to me. That, with, with how much you now know because of all the research you've done, yeah. has it ruined the world for you? I mean, do you sit yeah, down at the dinner table going, Oh, I know what's going to happen uh, with that salad. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I can. That I was can, a poor choice with the milk combination there. Right, right, and uh, the I wrote yeah, gulp. Yep, your, and your corn kernels—they're going to go right all come out the other end. Yeah, I yeah. know. I know too much. I know too yeah. much. All of the books. Bonk's, the Bonk was a, a, a the Bonk was a book about people, who, researchers who study sexual physiology, human. Right. And uh, I, while I was working on it, I read um, Masters and Johnson, Human Sexual Response, which is very, very detailed, every stage of the human sexual response cycle. And when you were reading that book, you can't help but go, when you're in the act, you're like, oh, this is the part where the earlobes engorge. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> because it's hmm. fascinating, but it's also very distracting. It's like, <laughs> it's like the pre-flight checks, you know? Earlobes inflating. Check. <laughs> Things are going well. <laughs> Ready right. for blast off. Yeah. And, and Stiff led naturally to uh, looking at the afterlife, which is what comes next if you yeah, yeah, for yeah. That. that. Are people right. disappointed that you don't give them the answer? Okay, after uh, all this research, uh, I'm here to tell you that... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no. I kind of I kind of give my readers credit for knowing that I'm not going to have the answer. You know, that Mary Roach with her BA in psychology is going to come out with the answer of, you know, for all eternity, where, you know, what We've happens when we die. I'm still working on it. No, now, how did no. that start? Was it the Duncan, um, the, uh, trying to weigh D the soul? Duncan McDougall, yeah, exactly. And also, uh, there was a chapter in Stiff that had to do with, um, early, early on in the days of uh, anatomy and figuring out what the human body was all about, there was a period of time where the, um, researchers, I'm going to call them scientists, they would... Uh, uh, look around and be, they wouldn't, didn't know what all the bits and pieces did. And so they'd you know, take the liver and go like, maybe this is the seat of the soul. I don't know, it's kind of a boss looking organ, maybe the liver. And then actually it was the Babylonians or someone thought that the, the liver was the seat of the soul. And then the, the heart was popular for a long, long time. And then when more was realized about, you know, if you drive a stake through somebody's brain, their personality changes. So they go, huh, I mean, this is probably where it's at. I could see how that would happen. <laughs> it's far more screaming in your day. Uh, so I just I loved the idea that that scientists were trying to you know, uh, use science to figure out the soul, the spirit, which is you know it's the stuff of religion and right. spirituality. But there were scientists who were plugging away at it, and I, that was what that book was about. And it feels like you go after uh, taboos that shouldn't be. They're just they're just the lives we live. I like live. taboos. I think taboos are interesting in that they're topics that. People are um, they're repelled by and drawn to at the same time, mm -hmm. and I like to uh, kind of. There's a bit of a, a rubbernecker appeal to my books, but what I want I don't want people to to, to pick up the book and 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 uh, just be grossed out. I want them to think, oh, I thought this was going to be really gross, but it's really interesting. And often people look away from things like the alimentary canal, you know, the tube from here to here. It's so interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, it's gross. It's a little gross. Uh, particularly from the waist down. Um, but actually, the chewing part was the grossest thing for me. But, but what I was going to say is that it, it just, it, it, it is so, uh, it, it, when you dive in there, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. And you, have to, and you end up with this respect for these things that you never see, your own organs, these precious things. You never see them. They, they're in there just doing their job, and they're kind of amazing. So I want to pull people in by that kind of like, ooh, do I dare? But then I want them to go away with some, I don't know, some, some new found awe for their own being. Their I own. do. I mean, th these books have horrified me in ways that I never thought <laughs> I would be surprised by. Um, no, I, it's almost like I'm, you know, I, I have the same um, response that you do after learning these things. I'm I so kind of walk around and really kind of look at things differently, you know. Hmm. You do kind of, yeah. It's interesting. Um, but really, they're, they're mostly just uh, stories of us, the, the things we've been trying to figure out forever. And mm -hmm. 
you know, nuns accepted, you know, we're all eventually probably going to have sex at some point. We're going to die. We're going to eat. Mm -hmm. We're going to um, be shot into outer space <laughs> because we're we're already there. If you're looking at it from a certain perspective, right. <laughs> you know, and we wonder, we wonder about afterlives. <laughs> Uh, I want to know how much my soul weighs. Yeah, Please. well, I, Duncan overestimated just a little bit, three quarters of an ounce. That's, I think he, there was something wrong with his. He was he put people on. A, this was like 1907 or so, and mm -hmm. he he worked at a TB sanitarium. He had a, st sadly a steady supply of dying people, and he thought mm -hmm. that, he knew someone had a big silk scale, a giant scale that was pretty accurate at the time. <laughs> And he's like, what if we just put them on the scale and we watch when they die and see if the needle goes down just a little bit? Which was kind of lovely and, I mean, naive, but yeah. um, I, I just, I don't, again, I love that he did it, that he tried to figure it out. And uh, I'm concerned because, you know, I'm a rocker and we have less soul than jazz. Yeah, so yeah. I'm concerned I'm not going to have as much of a, you know, <laughs> footprint when it, when it ends. Um, what seduced you into human sexuality with Bonk? Um, I was, um, and this doesn't make sense to me now, but I was reading film quarterly. Uh, I don't ever read film quarterly. I don't have a background in film studies, but I must have been in some, somebody's living room or something. But I, hmm. it was a, 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 there was a reference in there to the colposcopic films of Masters and Johnson, and I knew that a colposcopy had to do with a, it's like a cervical biopsy, and, and I w that suggested to me that Masters and Johnson had filmed women from the inside while they were sexually responding. And I, re I remember thinking, God, that's unbelievably creative and awkward. And how did they, who came in to do, who were their subjects? How did they get funding? And this was the 50s. And, I th and that was, at that moment, I thought, sex research, that is, that's the next book is one of those moments where you just knew reading that one sentence. Yeah, when you see penis camera, you go, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's worth exploring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The artificial coition machine. But, and I, I was so disappointed that machine was dismantled, apparently. It doesn't exist anymore. It should be in the Smithsonian. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't, uh, you can't, you cannot uh, <laughs> see it, try it out. You can't. <laughs> it was. Uh, the thing that was amazing was like out. variable speed. It was quite <laughs> sophisticated. Right. Yeah. And apparently, it, would, it went faster than any man could. So there. Oh. Were, <laughs> the, it had a lot of stamina. It had a lot of stamina. Like of stamina. the men in the lab were like, oh. <laughs> when the robots come, we're done. <laughs> so. But, uh, but tell us a bit about the difficulties of getting access to such a rarefied and secretive group yeah. of people doing research. I mean, how do you get to, to get in the room with live <clears throat> research subjects in sexuality? Yeah, that was, and that was something when I pitched the book. I said, of course, I'll be on the scene with my notepad, my reporter's notebook. I'll be reporting. I'll be right there. And, and so I'd call up researchers and explain what I wanted to do. And they were like, hell no, no, you can't. It's so hard to even get anybody to, to participate. No, you can't be there with a notepad, but you could be a subject. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, um, yeah, that, uh, and I, what I wanted, and it was, it was complicated by the fact that what I wanted it, to, to be able to write about was the Masters and Johnson thing, which is bringing a couple in, not right. just if you're studying arousal or orgasm, you really don't need two people. You need one person and a finger is fine. And an earlobe. And an, and an earlobe. <laughs> or I, whatever, a vibrator, whatever. They, you send them off and they do their thing. But Masters and Johnson actually brought in couples. And every now and then someone does that study. And I'm like, that's what I want. I need to report on this. And I finally found this guy in London. He was doing a, it was an imaging technique, three-dimensional ultrasound movies. And he was... Uh, it's ultrasound movie, I know, and and so he wanted to do he was wanted to do the organs in you know <laughs> sexual congress, and I emailed and I said so I really I I I really love to be there for this historic undertaking, and um, would that be okay? And he wrote back and he said, well, um, that would be fine, but we're having difficulty finding brave subjects to volunteer. And so if your organization would like to provide a couple. I'd be happy to arrange it. So um, my organization called its husband. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I wasn't entirely forthcoming. I think I said, 
So Ed, you know how you said you hadn't been to London in 25 years? <laughs> um, I think we should go. I have a project I need to do. We'll go and we'll like stay in a really nice hotel and we'll go to see some plays in the West End. We'll go see Jeremy Irons eating something. He has a big beard right now. And we'll go and we'll uh, maybe go to Stonehenge. We have to have sex in front of a guy in a lab coat. And we'll <laughs> um, and my wonderful idiot of a husband went, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he had, from the beginning with this book, he said, oh, sex research, sign me up. Uh, not realizing what he was getting into. So, I'll tell you, being so, nonchalant is dangerous. Yeah, uh-huh. Yep, yep, yep. So anyway, that, that was, uh, each book had its own unique challenges. <laughs> so. And uh, I'm interested in the, the titles, um, because you use single word slang very often, you know, gulp, bonk, grunt. Uh, all the way down the line, except packing for Mars. Yeah, that's well, three I words. Four more, four syllables. I know. Um, what happened we there? failed. We just failed. We co everybody, my agent, my my publicist, everybody I know tried to come up with a one-word slangy title, and you all will be welcome to shout out anything. Come up with it. Had, yeah. It had to suggest the, the human. It is a little late. Yeah. yeah. Um, the you know that it, had, it was like humans in space. It had to suggest, because it wasn't a rocket book. It was the right. human experience of you know, weightlessness and all the weird elements of it, physical, psychological, all that. So what one word? Someone suggested void, which there's a particularly good zero gravity toilet chapter in there, I have to, if I do say so myself. <laughs> so that would have worked, but only if you knew mm. that fact. Otherwise, it was kind of a boring yeah. void. What, what, would you, what would you have called it? Yeah, see? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, see? You know, I'm, the pressure's I know. on, but well, I, I don't know. We, anyway, nobody could come up. Nobody could come up with it. Space. Anyway. Spaciness. S space, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but, that's. But, but how did that begin? What, the, the book? The, the or book the on, on the actual study of how to survive in space. Okay, All these that, tests that started um, a long, long time ago when I was writing for, I was a contributing editor at Vogue, as you could tell, because I'm so fashionable. Um, I was writing for the health editor at Vogue magazine, and uh, my assignment was osteoporosis. Which is a little, it's not that scintillating as a topic, and I thought, how can I jazz this up a bit? So I called, Na I know that NASA, because uh, astronauts lose a lot of bone in zero gravity, because your skeleton right. kind of just says, well, Doesn't we don't need that anymore. Right. So um, uh, I was talking with an astronaut, who's also an MD, and as tends to happen when I'm on the phone with somebody, we veered off into a, a tangent, and he told me about this video camera toilet that the astronauts train on, because a, a zero-gravity toilet, you're, you're not sitting down, you're sort of docking. <laughs> and it's a small hole, and you've got to get the angle um, right. of evacuation properly, or you're going to blo block the air hole, because it's an air, it's like, a, it's like sitting on a shop vac. It's like, <laughs> So it's, you don't want to get too close to it. And yes, you don't want to get too close. You don't, yeah. The, uh, then you really get voided. Oh, then you get yeah. voided. So um, uh, anyway, I, thought, I, mean, I remember thinking, I probably can't work this into the Vogue article. But <laughs> I was like, one day, one day I will write about the video. I will sit on the video toilet at NASA. And by God, I did. <laughs> like, so basically, I wrote a, I wrote a book around that. I'm like that. Did you ever see the, the other side of Gulp? The other, yeah. The, the, uh, there's the ad for this faucet, this Kohler faucet. It's so obnoxious. It's this couple comes into an architect and they have this faucet and they put it on his desk and they go, build a house around this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, video toilet, build a book around this. And it, it's amazing because it's, it's closed circuit TV. So imagine, if you will, you're sitting there and the video camera is up in the bowl facing up, and here's the, close, there's the TV screen next to you showing the view. I, it's like backing up in a Prius. <laughs> yes. Very much so, yes. Beep, 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 beep. Beep, without the sound effects. Yes, it was, a, it was a, an unusual, unique view of something that you know, you don't you're very see. familiar with, kind of like the view of Earth from space, I imagine. No. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or something like that. <clears throat> What's on your packing list for Mars? Um, on my packing list for Mars, um, condiments, because the food is bland. Condiments. I, I, heard, okay. I heard the 
Condiments. Condiments. Condom, mint, mint condoms. <laughs> no, uh, condiments. Um, you know what I would bring? It's very uniformly colored and drab. There, you know, and as you look out the window, there's, there's no color up there. I'd bring one of those paint, Benjamin Moore, you know, the swatch, you know, that you fan out. I just to look at color, and some, uh, if I can, so, if I could, some plants. That's interesting. Because actually, plants. when you watch all the space movies, there's always like white and black. Yeah. It's like no one ever bothers to to paint their no, space they stations. Don't. No, they don't. And, and they forget to bring the Benjamin Moore. Right. Yeah, because they're not listening to me. Yeah. They probably don't have band aids either. I'd be worried about the small things. The band-aids, yeah. Because yeah. you're just floating around all the time. Yeah, and you, 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 you know what? This, I love this fact. When you're sleeping, um, your hands float up and like wake you up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I, what I found um, amazing is that, because I got to experience weightlessness on the vomit right. comet, that plane that goes like this and you're weightless for a while. Uh, and it was the most amazing thing in my entire life. It was so cool to be weightless. The, I couldn't believe astronauts uniformly, like after the second day, they're like, yeah, this weightless stuff is such a pain in the ass. You know, your hand floats up. You can't put anything down. It floats away. I'm like, you're complaining about floating in space. It's awesome. But they, yeah. but they get annoyed with it. They want to put something down. I have explosive snoring issues, so I would blow myself out of the ship if I were you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what? If you, Where's if, Ben? Hmm? If you applied uh, for the astronaut program in Japan, that is one of the considerations. If somebody snores loudly, they are out. Yeah. Yeah. Because they so, can't get rid of you. Because they, yeah, yeah, right. Keep on stuffing stuff in your mouth. Yeah. Um, you were in India writing about the world's most dangerous pepper. Yes. And that's how you came around to... Naturally, that led to a book Natural. on military science. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was reporting on uh, the, the ghost pepper, the boot jolokia, which is... Uh, there's a lot of arguing about what's the world's hottest pepper, but at right. the time, they claimed that they were the hottest chili pepper, and there was a brutal chili pepper eating contest that locals would do, and the prize was like $100, and some of them were getting taken away in an ambulance, and they were like emptying... <laughs> buckets over their heads and drinking milk, powdered milk. It was, it was an insane scene. But somebody, while I was there, said, did you know the Indian military, may, they weaponized this chili pepper. They made kind of a pepper spray, but it was a, it was a bomb with a powder. And it would like to clear a room, to you know, like clear yeah. terrain or disperse a crowd. And I thought, well, I better report on that, because that's interesting. And uh, so I went over to the lab where they were doing this work. The Indian Defense Ministry, and they do some. They were they were like an ESP telepathy study that I missed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they were doing a lot of. You should have thought of that one. I should have. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Boom. Boom. Yeah. Uh, that, so they were uh, yeah, working on a leech repellent. They were doing. They had the chili pepper. And I thought, wow, military science seems a, like a little more surprising and esoteric than I thought it might be. And I, I, I yeah. wasn't inter interested in writing about um, guns and bombs and strategy, because that's covered a lot on the Discovery Channel and other places. Right. Uh, but I, but there, there's just this whole universe of um, labs that you never hear about. And that, that I get excited about that, if I can step into some world that I don't know anything about. So yeah. that, that was how that happened. And flies. Talk about flies. Flies, yeah, flies. Flies, flies are interesting, um, particularly from a military perspective, because right. flies are both the enemy and the hero. The, en the enemy, particularly historically, because flies, imagine a big field camp like Civil War or something where you've got the open pit latrine and the mess tent, nothing's refrigerated, and you've got a lot of flies, tons of flies, because also there's, there's dead bodies and there's rotting food. Flies are like, ooh, we like, this is mecca for them. There are right. thousands of flies, and they're going from the latrine open pit and over to the food and landing there, and thereby inoculating the food with the stuff in the pit latrine, and then it's sitting in the sun, and so the bacteria are multiplying and multiplying, and then you'd get hundreds of hundreds of very sick, dehydrating, and often dying soldiers. And, and um, disease killed far more mm -hmm. soldiers back then right. than um, bullets or bombs. So the fly, uh, when, the, when, when it was figured out that 
the fly was you know, the smoking gun, like the, that they realized the fly was like, the, they call it the mechanical vector because it's simply landing, picking up some bacteria and dumping it in the food, landing. And, and, and so that once that was figured out, they would be, in World War II, there were fly control units, <laughs> fly control unit. And, uh, which I love, and, and uh, there were fly death quotas. Like every soldier was supposed to kill 50 flies a day. Like, dun, 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 like, like with the fly swatter. Uh, so the, the, the What whole... do you do when you're done early? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess now but, I just have to go to war. Yeah. So uh, the flies, yeah, so uh, flies uh, are uh, just, I got really into it. House, house flies, they're, they're fascinating in their own weird way. They, the fly, like if humans ate like flies, a rest, going to a restaurant would be a really weird thing because what they do, they find something they want to eat, they regurgitate the, en the digestive enzymes onto the food, kind of mm. make a puddle out of it, and then suck it up. So they digest it outside the body and then suck it up, which is a different way <laughs> to do it. I don't, no judgment. No judgment. No judgment. <laughs> I mean, if that's what you do. Um, that's what, because that's what you do when you're a fly. It's, so, yeah. It's flies. a free country. Oh, plus there are these amazing World War II. You know the posters from World War II? There's just these amazing posters. And there'd be, there are some, like there's a fly, huge, I must say, enormous fly on its back. And somebody's got a bayonet stabbing at the fly. And it says, this is the enemy. You know, just like a really sci-fi weird stuff. So uh, it makes it more exciting for the guys in the trenches, you know, if you actually have to stab them. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Like on the poster, it looked so much bigger. I'm like, <laughs> so, um, so flies. Uh, that I found that whole that whole thing fascinating. The other, the other, the other which leads to maggots. Yes, it, which leads to to very very little. Adorable flies, maggots, Adorable. maggots. So maggots. And this is now we go back to this is World War One, where uh, there was a. A, a field surgeon, William Bear, who noticed over and over uh, when, when uh, soldiers would come in who had been lying out wounded with uh, you know, big gaping wounds on their limbs, sometimes they were infested with maggots, which initially you would sort of think, oh, that's horrifying. They'll, they'll, they're dirty. They'll infect it. Mm -hmm. and when the, but when the maggots were removed, he noticed this pink granulated fresh healthy tissue and no infection. And he saw this over and over again that the wounds that were doing the best were the ones that had maggots. Because what maggots do, as we all know, they, like, they prefer dead tissue. They don't eat live tissue. They like dead things. So they performed debridement, which is you know, what you can do it surgically, you know, kind of like remove it all. Right. But the maggots do an amazing job because they have these little, you know, their they little jaws. They get down jaws. to the cell level. They go down to the cell, yeah, down to the cellular level, and they're very thorough. So the maggot, and this is still done today, maggot debridement therapy, maggot therapy, the, the maggot is an FDA-approved medical device. I kid you not. There's it, a Medicare reimbursement code. <laughs> Medicare reimbursement. True. Yeah. True. For maggots. Anyway. Uh, well, I've so. always, since, since reading that, I kind of wanted to go and uh, you know, go to the ER <laughs> sometime to say, yeah, I need, I need maggots. <laughs> really, no, we could sew you up now. I, I really prefer maggots. If you, yeah. As you can imagine, it's Because you need a, a prescription a a, for them. You do. You need a prescription. Someone because, has to send maggots to your, you know, your doctor. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, I, I know that if, if anybody needs maggots, I can hook you up. I, get, I know I, I got the guy. Yeah. You have, to, you have to get them quickly because then they're flies after that. You got to, yeah, that's the, the tough part with, with, <laughs> ma with <laughs> we got your mag, oh. Oh. Now tomorrow, you have to yeah. kill 50 of them. Right. <laughs> with this large bayonet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but but the, the tricky part with maggot therapy, are we going on a little too long about maggots? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the tricky thing is that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, like any dressing, the little cage, it's called a cage dressing, because it keeps them in. You don't want them straying and, and right. becoming flies in a hospital. No, it's not good. So uh, they, have to, they have to be changed every, like, through four days before they want to go away and pupate and become a fly. Right. So, so th th that means some poor uh, person on the nursing staff has to change the maggots, put the new ones in, the next dose. And that's not, a, that's not fun for some people. <laughs> I want to bring it back. Yeah. Do you ever get ideas from Snapple Cap? <laughs> those little, the little facts that they have. Um, like this one. I just what is that to have one? It. This one says that. This is going to be my next book. Antar okay. 
This might be. Okay. Antarctica is the largest desert in the world. And you've been there three times. Yeah, don't you have to have, you don't have to have sand to be a desert? You know what, desert island is often under, misunderstood as just being a sand island. It just means it's deserted. Yeah, it's a desert island. It's a desert I want to go island. to the desert island. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Many people make that mistake. Yeah. I'm always but looking, not you. looking for Snapple. Yeah, well, if you find a, a I found out one, you know, babies don't actually tear for three months. I just thought our child was dehydrated. They That's, don't for no. three months? You learn a lot from Snapple. Who? Mary I, Roach and Snapple caps. Yeah. Maybe I, should just go, maybe I should go work for Snapple. Uh, you, I like it'd be a good book title, Snapple. <laughs> one word. Uh, you carry a, a notebook and a recorder. And then you hand transcribe everything, which is... I type. Yeah. yeah that's, is that hand transcribe? Yeah, I guess because it, the you hands use your are, hands. I'm using my hands, OK. Yeah. You can't do it with maggots. But, but it's, yes. it's, to, it's, to ref, it's to refresh your memory of everything that occurred. Yeah, because you're yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, sh so I don't um, outsource it. Like a lot, unless this is interesting. A lot of uh, uh, yeah. writers now send the MP3 to uh, you know, the Philippines or India and, and it's good, somebody does it, and it's mm -hmm. transcribed. No, I, I still do my own transcribing for two reasons. Um, uh, one, it prevents me from over tape recording, because I always have in the back of my head, this is going to be a killer to transcribe. <laughs> so I, I, may, I, I try to limit how much I tape record, because mm -hmm. I know I have to type it. And, and it, 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 it makes just, I remember I've got the sound effects and the way somebody talks, and I, I need to kind of relive it before I write it. Yeah. Yeah. You, your office must just look like something blew up inside there that was made of paper. I mean, how, how do you control the voluminous amount of data that you have? How do you sift through it all when you begin to compose a book? I use a very simple, I've got a filing cabinet with folders. And I'm like, that, this goes in flies, this goes in maggots. No, I'm, no. Uh, uh, it's, very, it's very. Don't put them together. Don't, uh, don't mix them up. No, I, I'm very. Um, um, Neanderthal in my ways. I don't use, what are those? That's a great term. Neanderthal. And it's pronounced Neanderthal. Neanderthal. Not thaw. Even though Is they it, weren't they so were, much. They weren't so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, re I That's resemble why that. They, they, they thought we'll add it on to the word. And subliminally, people will think we're tall. I just like that, you know, flies. From now on, I'll just refer to them as mechanical vectors. Mechanical vectors, yeah. That's, that's something I'm going to now endeavor to achieve in my life. I want to be a mechanical vector at some point. And, and then you're going to have a run-in with vector control, which uh, is the I'm people ready who for deal that. with flies. Vector control. And train for vector. vector. Um, you, you come across so much bizarre material. And sometimes um, you get to keep samples. You have a, a sample of stench soup in your closet. I do, I'm yeah. I'm concerned about the fact that you, you know. I do, I do. I, I know I, it's sealed. It's, but what, what, what kind of a party is that going to take for you to go, hey, guys, <laughs> wait here? Uh, I, um, yeah, when I was uh, uh, reporting it, I, 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 did, I did smell stench soup, which was a, it was a, it's a, it's a non-lethal weapon. In other words, it's, it's like the, the chili pepper bomb. It's to clear a room. Uh, and the and, uh, Manel Forever. Chemical Census Center was tasked by the military to come up with the most potent effective room clearing stench. Uh, and it started with US government, US government bathroom malodor, which is a, you can purchase this. It's a standardized stink, which was used for testing latrine deodorants in, in, during some wor World War II, Civil War, I don't know, probably World War II. Anyway. But why can you still purchase it? There's not um, a lot of latrine, because, you know, because, like, well, I gotta test my latrine. You can, you can test your, you know, any bathroom deodorant cleansing product using. It's just, it's a handy, standardized, horrible bathroom horrible smell. stink. <laughs> yeah, so they started with that, okay. But they, uh, the A being the Monell Chemical Senses stink experts, they did something really clever. They added a kind of floral fruity top note, and the top note is when you, you know, take a little sniff, you, you, that's what you smell. And because what people tend to do on their first sniff is take a tentative sniff, and they go, oh, it's not bad. And then, then on the keeper inhale, <laughs> it's called the keeper inhale, they go, because they think, oh, it's good. and that's when it hits them. Yeah. So it's a particularly um, 
dastardly, well-conceived uh, yeah. scent. And it's also a mixture of horrible smells because a mixture, it's not identifiable, so it's, it makes you nervous. You're like, well, I don't know what that is. It might be dangerous. So that also makes you leave. So stench soup, a lot of thought went into stench yeah. soup. Yeah. The military, uh, yeah. it's not the first sniff. <laughs> that should be like the new poster. <laughs> it's not the first sniff. But it's such a bizarre, uh, you know, like they just said, here, have an archival uh, well, I asked, sample. The thing is, I smelled it when I was at Monell. They put it under, it was under a fume hood, you know, mm. and they, uh, they took the, the, all the samples are carefully kept there, and they brought it out, and they opened it up for me to smell, and then the researchers is like, put it back, put the hood, put the hood down, put the hood down, because apparently it like gets into the, the duct system at Monell, and like people like, evacuate the building. Um, <laughs> How many so, times that place must empty out? Like, I know. So I, but I, when I was writing the book, I couldn't remember what it smelled like. So I said, "Will you send me a sample?" So they sent me, a, you know, a vial in activated charcoal in a bag, triple, triple bagged Vial's in a box. A good word. What? Vial is a good word. Vial, for it. yeah, vial. In a, that is a good word for it. A vial. So I, I had this little sample, and I, um, I knew because she'd sent a couple others, like just butyric acid, which is just run-of-the-mill vomit smell. It's not, hmm. uh, or Parmesan cheese, depending on context, good or bad. <laughs> so. Um, and I had a problem with that, so I thought, I can't open stench soup. I just can't do it. And so I kept it so long. I thought about taking it to the Republican National Convention. <laughs> <laughs> Were you invited to speak? <laughs> no. I would have had to. She I don't know how I would have gotten there. in. Um, but just imagine the, the, good, the press I would have gotten uh, when I was removed from the, anyway. So, but I had it for so long that finally, like on the book tour, I'm like, all right, I, I was doing some event, and I thought, I'm gonna open it up, and I had all this build up. Well, the activated charcoal was so effective that it essentially had just absorbed all, this, all the stink. There, it really, huh. it was nothing, there was nothing left. It was such an anticlimax, it was embarrassing. I'm up on stage and then like <laughs> preparing for this. You know, I was a little nervous that it might, they might have to close the building down or something after I opened it, but. That was a bold idea. It was, it was bold, yeah, and. and We're not gonna do and that anticlimactic. <laughs> no, we have, we have things to throw into the audience, though. We do. Um, <laughs> I, I had a vulture vomit at me in close quarters. They do that. Yeah, well, I, yeah. Know, I know now. Yeah, it was I know. the last thing I thought was going to happen when I. How did this happen? I had? was. It was an abandoned uh, building in the back of a military base. They bought houses, you know, years, hundred years ago, and just kind of left them there in the woods. Yeah. And we were on patrol, and I was like, ah, oh, abandoned house, treasures. And yeah. So I went to the upstairs, <laughs> which was like, you know, about to collapse, and I found this door, which had been just kind of a sealed little trap, you know, side door, which went into a a very little piece of roof, kind of a crawl space. I'm thinking, you know, there's going to be a jar of coins or antique photographs or, you know, the Holy Grail. And <laughs> so I jimmied it open with my, with my uh, Leatherman tool, and I can't, I can't see very well because it's dark in there. I just oh. came from the light, and so I, I get in there, and there's this large, suddenly this large dark shape, and I'm like, okay, specter. Um, <laughs> and it just made this croak and vomited at me, and I tried to tear my nose off to escape. <laughs> It was like the worst thing I've ever smelled. Yeah, you know what? I once went to a lecture called Turkey Vultures Fact and Fiction. And... <laughs> Mary Roach, ladies okay. and gentlemen. <laughs> Never a weekend the same. It's not the first sniff. Yeah, so... And the, the guy who was giving the lecture, uh, he said, turkey vultures, it's a, it's a, it's a defense, because it, it, right. it's really rank and vile, and it's, it's you know, they, they do that to, to make you go away, and I imagine it's very effective. But, very coy effective. but coy <laughs> coyotes like to eat, this, was a fa this is fact, not fiction. Coyotes like to eat the turkey vomit, so they will intentionally harass the vulture to make them vomit and then eat, <laughs> eat it, which I thought was just, and the vulture probably going, oh, I need to rethink. This whole vomit thing. Yeah. <laughs> I rarely get to tell Nature's. that story. So. <laughs> Nature is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And the uh, he had brought a vulture, and the name of the vulture was Mr. Friendly. Yeah. 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 He wasn't aggressive. He was just disgusting. Just disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you must live in a world of near constant revelation and discovery. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to kind of fall through the world, just an endless curiosity. I, yeah. I, I know, I, and, you're, and your books kind of reanimate that in, in people reading them. I, I, I love them. That, the, you know, you get these origins of phrase that suddenly make sense because you must come across so many yeah. of them, like you know, licking your wounds. Yeah, yeah. Which right. we just think of as you know, kind of a thing, yeah, something you say or dog. But actually, saliva yeah, is it's a miracle substance. Yeah, it, it, don't it, get me started. It neutralize. <laughs> 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 yeah. In bonk, it's one thing. And yeah. It, but with relating to uh, to viruses, <laughs> it makes viruses ineffective. So yeah, you know, everyone and talks it about promotes healing. Yeah. 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 Like, so, yeah. so yeah, if you if it, yeah, there was some horrible study where the, uh, um, they had there was some animal that they prevented from, like the animal could lick, but they disconnected the salivary gland. So yeah. without, I know it's horrible. Put, erase it. I need the neuralizer. But, yeah. <laughs> um, they, but without the saliva, the, the wounds healed a lot more slowly. Huh. And so you know, like kissing, you know, kissing a child's boo boo, you yeah. know, is something that's actually. Apparently, it like speeds up the healing. Yeah. yeah. Disinfects. Mono it's is the only stuff. thing which gets confusing in this line. Yeah, oh, yeah, mono, yeah. You know, yeah. It's like you, know, you have to pick your nose or your eye. That's the most direct access to your system with the least offense. It's yeah. not your mouth. Right, right. Yep. Yeah, you, now it, you know. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Lick the doorknob. Yeah. If you, you can't catch a killed. cold, if you catch a cold from somebody who's drinking something, it's probably because you picked up the bottle and you got the virus particles on your. Yeah. finger and then you picked your nose, which people do way more. Science has shown. Science has shown. <laughs> somebody did the data. It's in one of my books. I don't remember which one. But, um, they, there was somebody watching a lecture hall and counting, you know, like how many times people touch their eye or pick their nose. And um, anyway, there's more details in the book. <laughs> <laughs> the, all the books are like this, by the yeah. way. Endlessly well, fascinating. <laughs> Um, but what convinced you to follow the tragic uh, journey of dinner in Gulp? How did that come out? Come oh, it out? just that's one of those books. That, why, why didn't I think of doing that sooner? Just no. it was such, it's such uh, a roachable terrain. <laughs> the whole tube, you know, from chew, just chewing, uh, oral processing is what it's called. And there's people who study oral processing, like intraoral bolus rolling, because what you're doing when you chew, you take this food and you break it down, moisten it, and then put it together into a bolus, which is, was my favorite word for a while. I think it should have been a punk rock name. It like, definitely should. Yeah, like, bolus. You combine that with, you know, turkey, vulture, vomit, and you, <laughs> you've got something. Bolus. Opening for anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, but so you know, bolus rolling. I don't know that just that world and, and the people who studied were, were like just really deep down into oral processing. Just that's just so interesting. That's the kind of thing I love, like finding out that there is such a mm. discipline as oral processing. People who study it for years and years and publish papers and develop things like the tongue camera, <laughs> which exists. <laughs> Uh, I love that. Is there a camera for everything at this point? I think you've. Uh... Appar apparently, there. Apparently, yeah. There seems to be, or at least two parts. Take note. <laughs> yeah. um, so much to cover. My God. Um, do you think? And this is kind of one of those big, big thumpy questions. But do you think that science is suffering like it did when it first started explaining mysteries that our ignorance uh, had relied on gods to solve? Do, is it suffering now? Yeah, Are we, we going huge, back there? You mean? We have a huge anti-intellectual move. Yes, yes. We're fake science, bad, science bad. It, um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm very. Uh, I was find it, it kind of the comfort that we had? Like, listen, I don't understand it, and and so, good. Right, uh, right. I'm glad someone does. If and everyone's figuring getting sick, it's out. because we've angered God. Yeah. And <laughs> Yeah. Good. You deserve it, every one of you. But yeah. then someone came in and said, well, you know, if you take antibiotics, you'll be OK. Yeah, right. Like, huh. Right. <laughs> well, God gave work? us antibiotics yeah. then, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, how, do you feel that, that that movement right now, you're writing almost entirely science-based research yeah, stuff? Yeah. I, I know it's, it's very uh, strange to me that, that science would be a, something that you could just decide, I don't by that whole science, I mean, science, it's the, science, it's like, it's, it's everything. Like, how do you not buy, you know, have, or like, how is there anti-science? Science is kind of, it's, it's the reason we have the internet, it's the reason we have, it's the reason behind anything that is helpful that we have. Why, why would you be anti-science? 
I don't, I don't, I don't know, but I'm flummoxed and disheartened. I think also it's, it's so complicated and it's so filled with terms that make us uh, uncomfortable that I'm glad we have a spokesman who can articulate it for us in these books <laughs> because you know you write it like we're talking about it over dinner. Yeah, right. Um, you know, maggots over dinner, things like that. <laughs> uh, but you know, science is also full of hilarious terms. You must just be laughing oh, yeah. all the time, especially yeah, doing yeah. grunt in your newest book. Um, I mean, I just remember, you know, a flashlight is a moonbeam. It's not a flashlight. I'm like, who? What? You know, sneakers are go-fasters. Or they're sneakers. No, they're go-fasters. You know, this, did you ever, it's did not you? a pen. It's an ink stick. Yeah. I, mean, and it, I just learned all these crazy terms. An you ink know. stick. And a journalist is a media puke. Media puke. <laughs> or the enemy. Yeah. yeah, or the enemy. Or yeah. if, they're being, if they're in a charitable mood, pencil. <laughs> pencil, yeah. Uh, uh, what, yeah, no, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of really great slang, in, in, intentionally great, but then there's, uh, there, there are wonderful terms that somebody comes up, I can't believe someone comes up with a name for, like when I was packing for Mars, I was talking to the waste management engineers, and they were talking about, you know, the toilet we talked about before, the shop vac, mm -hmm. um, they were talking about how, um, because you're in zero gravity, sometimes there can be... Um, there's a rear view mirror on the toilet so that you can make sure there's no escapee. Because sometimes they, yeah. And, and there's also, you also have to be concerned about um, if, because it's um, there's a door, sort of like a sliding door that mm -hmm. sh seals off the toilet when you're done and you have to time it right, otherwise you may have fecal decapitation. <laughs> that is a term. That is. I don't that want is, that. Yeah. I don't want that. Whatever that is. Yeah. There's also uh, fecal popcorning. And these are terms in a journal paper, a journal paper that a guy That's at NASA good. wrote. I'm relatively certain that um, this terminology was how I ended up on The Daily Show because <laughs> the description for the show the night I was on was Chelsea Clinton has an interfaith wedding and Mary Roach discusses fecal decapitation. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's like, bring her on so we can write that. Yeah. yeah. It's a great coupling. It's a great coupling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's talk about uh, real briefly about how you interview because you don't just walk in as the outsider and get the outside information to, by, from people who clearly don't know you and certainly aren't uh, often interviewed. Right. Um, right. Which, which kind of, how do you work that? Uh, well, I don't really interview people in the sense that I don't come in with a list of questions because my feeling is that. I know so little about what a scientist does that I'm, I need them to let me know what the best questions are, and they need to kind of lead me to what's the most interesting. So I just, um, uh, it's, it's very much just a conversation. And, I, and also, I stay for a couple of days. Right, you double back. I, uh, yeah, I, um, I hang around for a long time, because the most interesting material generally comes up on the second day. Uh. I don't know, it just does. Uh, and um, so, I, so I make a real pest of myself. I, eat up lots of people's time, and I just hang out and, because I'm having fun just hanging out with this, this person and seeing what they do. So don't sit down with a microphone and a list of questions. Um, because if you need specific factual information, you can always email or call, you know? So. I, I don't either. <laughs> Whatever comes to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd love to hear some, it's interesting, you know, Grunt comes back um, kind of to stiff, you, know, you end up in the Dover, Delaware um, Military Mortuary yes. Affairs Unit, which uh, is a tough place to be. And I'd love to have you read a section of that, uh, if you'd be so kind. Sure. And then maybe uh, a piece that maybe is closer to, uh, to my experience uh, early on from Camp Pendleton. Yes, okay. Which just made me burst out laughing, and I actually held the place with, these are, uh, MRE, which are the military meals that you get in little bags. Um, this is the toilet paper, uh, which comes in them. And actually, this is their promotion. It's got this is a promotional item. And I, I have had grunt, stickers huh? made up that say grunt yeah. on the toilet paper. And um, yeah. the, so this is a, um, you know, a, like one and a half cent value item that I will be giving away for free when I, anybody yeah. buys, uh, buys In the a military, copy. that's $14. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Here it's one cent. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So we have this special promotional commemorative grunt toilet paper. Yeah. And, and to make and sure you understand truly how specific they are with grunts, being that I was an infantry officer and a grunt. Um, this is from the MREs. Also, this is to warm up your MREs after they got rid of the uh, the little things you'd burn. And I, I love the specificity of it. If you look at this, it says not only to lean it, it's in lean it inclined, so you know that it's supposed to be at an angle, but it also has a rock drawn on here, and it says rock or something. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's like. I've seen that. I love you know, that. Or something. Yeah. If you're in a place where there's no rocks, you just imagine all these guys rock walking around going, "Well, we can't warm anything up." We have no rocks. I need to you know, know. I need to know who wrote that. There's a way to replace that idea. You know? Yeah, rock or something. That's good writing. Yeah. That's good. And before you read this, um, if rock you'd be so, or something. If you'd be so kind as to uh, put on these werewolf gloves before you read this, I'm just. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm doing a little research myself. This is for the military. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's do whatever you. Oh. Yeah, it's sorry. for the military. We don't know about all the research that we do in the military. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. <That's> good. <laughs> so, um, do we need context here? Let's see. Okay, yeah. so I'm at uh, Camp Pendleton here, and um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, I don't think I even need any context at all. All right. Yeah. Okay. This I this I'm really enjoying this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we set off into the scrub. Camp Pendleton is 200 square miles with 17 miles of California coastline, much of it left wild <clears throat> for practice invasions and amphibious assaults. It's like a national park reserved for the US Marine Corps and a lot of twitchy wildlife. <laughs> Uh, I mean, this is parentheses. The grunts are forbidden to shoot the animals, but I'm guessing it happens. I'm guessing this because I recently visited the Camp Pendleton paintball range, and I asked to be shot to see what it feels like. Forty Marines volunteered. <laughs> the one who did the deed from 70 feet, hitting me precisely where he wanted to, can be heard in the background of a researcher's video going, that was very satisfying. <laughs> uh, and then the researcher says, it's almost like he knows you. <laughs> Take those off if you'd like. So, I, don't, I don't know if I ever wanted to. <laughs> Thank you. So um, how do they feel? Well, they're good. They're a little. They're a little. Um, you know, I think I need a smaller size. Smaller sizes. Yeah. yeah. But, is it is it hard to turn pages? Uh, you know, I didn't try. Do you want to? You know, I, I think it probably okay, is. We need more time on this. Uh, I know. I like that they're they're very veiny. Yeah. Which I didn't really. I never really thought the werewolf had that. The army's concerned about the moon. Okay. So. <laughs> There's a lot of obscure studies that you're paying for, as you'll find out in this fantastic book, which you might not have known about. Uh, we actually, when I was in Ramadi in my second tour in 2005, we had a young um, blonde surfer who was my lance corporal in, in my unit there at Camp Hurricane Point, and he was excruciatingly white. And uh, at night, we would say, you better put on some moon tan lotion before we go on a patrol because you're gonna get moon burn. <laughs> And of course, this was a joke for us um, until I read this book, and I thought, you know, I'll bet there's a researcher somewhere in the office working damn hard on moon tan lotion. <laughs> I just think in case. The Indian defense, the guy who did the leech repellent, is like probably working on that. I like one more piece, if you'd be so kind, just from the end at some point. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then we're take Without the gloves. Yeah. Yep. I got what I needed. Okay. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Me too. Me too. I'm good. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Okay. Um, yeah, this was, this was at um, um, the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System, which is actually the first place that I went. And I knew when I was there, it would probably be the end of the book, because it was uh, fairly intense and um, moving and uh, sad. But anyway, um, <clears throat> in the autopsy room, there's a pair of platformed aluminum stepladders on wheels. 
I thought that the ceiling was being repaired. No, no, Stone said, it's for perspective. Stone was the public affairs guy. No, no, it's for perspective. The autopsy photographers need to get up high to get the whole body in the frame. I guess war is like that, a thousand points of light, as they say. Only when you step back and view the sum, only then are you able to grasp the worth, the justification for the extinguishing of any single point. Right at this moment, it's tough to get that perspective. It's tough to imagine a stepladder high enough. Hmm. Hmm. Bring up the lights and let's have you ask questions from now on. I'm sure there's some good ones. We have, we have people put microphones gloves, coming around. And gloves if you'd like to <laughs> werewolf gloves. So if you'd like to ask a question, please put your hand up. It will get a microphone to you. And we will present to you uh, one Mary Roach. Here. Most of your chapters, Mary, would stand alone. So I'm curious about how you determine, obviously you just explained the ending for that book, which yeah. I very much enjoyed, if that's the right word for Thank reading you. that book. But um, how do you determine the order, and at what point do you determine the order that you're yeah. going to put your book together with? Yeah, good, uh, good question. Um, I, it isn't until quite late in the process that I know the order. I, uh, the first four or so months of a project is just random flailing. Like, maybe I'm going to write this. Maybe I'll write that. I don't know. This will go here. No, it'll go there. And I write an outline almost every other day. I write a new outline. And each one, I think, now I know where I'm going. And then I find out about something else, or I realize the chapter isn't what I thought it was about, and I change them all around. So probably like six or seven months into it, do I really have a sense of where everything will fall. And sometimes it makes sense. The transition from one to a, you know, one sort of leads up to the next one in a clear way, and other times I sort of have to f fudge it with a transition. Um, so it, it's it, it's largely an intuitive thing, and I do move stuff around. Uh, you know, I may at the end pull one out, stick it over here, put something else in, and inevitably, inevitably, because publishers are very concerned with the first page and the first chapter, every single book might. Editor will go, Mary, you can't lead with this chapter. You got to lead with a different chapter. So, and she'll like yank, well, how about this one way at the end? Which for, for Gulp was, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't pull something out of the butt and put it up. <laughs> no, I couldn't. I, I got, I, so I had to go out and report a whole, uh, like a nose and smell chapter so that I could start with something else. So um, anyway, it, it's a constant. You can't get too wedded to the order of things. Because uh, uh, at least with me, I'm always changing. Do you do that? Just move, yeah. move stuff around? Yeah. I'm still doing it with my yeah. book. Yeah. <laughs> they just won't let me change the page count. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. How do you find professional scientists react to your books? I mean, they write you, obviously, probably. And you mean the ones who are in the book or just readers? No, just in general, readers. Um, for the most part, the, well, the ones who read it, um, you know, I, I'm always surprised if when I hear from somebody who has a degree in science who re reads one of my books because I think you know I think of them as too simple for somebody who, for whom that's their profession. But uh, I think it's it's fun sometimes for them to see an outsider's perspective, uh, hmm. and so I do I do get nice feedback, and I'm always very excited to hear from. You know, from a from a doctor or a, a real scientist who's who's read the book and liked it. Um, the people in the book, uh, I'm always the most gratifying thing for me is to get feedback from someone in the book saying that was great. I, I really, mm. I really liked it because I don't, I send the books out to there's like the the 20 people whose lives I disrupted most. <laughs> um, that's where you know the, you get 20 author copies in a box, and I, those all go to those people. And, and sometimes I don't hear back. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Did you just not read it, or do you hate it? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Hello. I'm going to do the NPR technique. So what is something you've learned that you most wish you hadn't? <laughs> oh. Oh. Well played. OK. I, um, I've gotten over it mostly <laughs> by now. But when I was writing Gulp, 
um, just, I was disgusted by my own chewing and other people's chewing. And I just was like, you know, you go to a restaurant, you look around, you're like, go do that in private, it's disgusting. <laughs> so, um, because I, I watched, you know, videos of intraoral bolus rolling and like what's going on in the mouth and the saliva and the whole, and then swallowing, there's these amazing x-ray footage of like the bolus going down mm -hmm. and, Ah. I've actually seen that like in high school. Yeah, the, like, the guy, and, and the jaw like, always looks wrong. It's like right. Yeah, right. right. And the guy has glasses. <laughs> like, you see the Disjointed. glasses, and then the, the thing goes down. And I, I, I don't know. I wish I'd never. I, I would rather not know all that. No. So, but thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> We're back. Mary, welcome to Michigan from Michigan Writers. I'm wondering if you can give some advice to the nonfiction writers in the audience, um, and also maybe say what's next for you. Uh, sure, the, well, let's see, advice would be, um, uh, have fun, write about, what, write about what makes you excited and, and what's fun for you. I mean, people sometimes say, well, how do you decide what, to put in your books are really broad topics. How do you decide what to, goes in? It's like, what's going to be the most, what's going to be the coolest, most fun thing for me to go and do? Because I think that that enthusiasm and fun uh, uh, comes through, and the reader gets to have fun. So you know, if if, if uh, I, oh, I'm going to paraphrase. I don't know who said this. Some maybe James Elroy, Elroy, Elmore Leonard. I don't know. Some some L related writer said. Um, somebody asked for his advice, and he said, I leave out the parts people skip, which I think is really, <laughs> I think that's good advice, right there. That As for what I'm working on next, I am a bookless woman. I have backed out of a project, and I don't know what the next one will be. I'm thinking I'd like to do something with more of a narrative through line, as they say in publishing. And I'm open to suggestions. We should crowdsource my next book. This so. is going to get weird. <laughs> So if you want to, you know, Mary Roach one at Gmail. If you've got some, uh, if you've got a good story for me, you know, a little Roachy, sciencey maybe, not necessarily, but like more of a, a narr some sort of like characters that go all the way through, but that'll allow interesting tangents. That's what I'm kind of thinking. That's but, not. But be succinct. But be succinct. <laughs> yes, two words. <laughs> oh, one word. Uh, anyway, yeah. So I don't know. I'm doing some shorter pieces, and I am kind of shifting gears a little bit. What? Science and climate change. Oh, Elizabeth Colbert has so got that sewed up. But not funny. Well, I don't, I think funny would be, a, a, I think that might be a challenge uh, 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 for me. I, you know, I, I, I'm choosing, when I choose my topics, I'm definitely choosing ones that kind of work with my tone. To, and climate change would be tough, I think, to, to, for me, for, for my style and my tone. I mean, I mean it's an important topic. I'm hot-blooded. I don't have very much farther north to move. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some people are like, the Florida people are like, hey, this is going to be great. We can live on a peninsula in Minnesota. Thank, we'll get one here first, and we'll get one next. OK, thanks for taking my question. I had been thinking, wondering what you were doing next, and I had had two, two sort of subjects. Um, one, I was wondering, Bonk was written a while ago, and I'm wondering how the difference in the internet and all the pornography on internet could influence how Bonk would be written today as opposed mm -hmm. to when it was written. And then the other thing near and dear to my heart working in the wine industry in northern Michigan would be just alcohol and alcohol uh, uh -huh. yeah, influence yeah. on the body. Right, and how right. Societal. I thought about drunk because I like those one <laughs> yeah. words that end in K. Hey. And I like gin. There's, there's lots of subjects that could be. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm willing to be a subject. So. <laughs> uh, there's, a there. the, uh, the, uh, there's a book that recently came out called Cork Dork. And this, she, she's a wonderful writer. And she became a sommelier, which is a big undertaking. And it's such a fascinating, well-written book. Um, I mean, it's a specific. Oh, you are. Yeah. It's good, right? <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoyed that. And someone else, uh, Adam Rogers from Wired, an editor at Wired, wrote a book about alcohol. I think more about how it's made. Not so, but he has a couple chapters on drunkenness. 
Um, but I did think, I gave thought to drunkenness. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hi, Mary. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to ask if you've ever caught someone you've interviewed in a lie and how you handled it and or how you wish you'd handled it. Oh, if I caught them in a lie, somebody I interviewed. Um, no, you know, I'm usually interviewing uh, a, a scientist who's talking about their work. Uh, so they're, they're not trying to cover anything up. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever caught anybody in a lie. Sometimes, sometimes I think, as I'm a, I'm a little bit gullible. Um, like, I, I, someone once told me there's an active volcano in San Francisco. They pointed to this hill and they said, yeah, that's an active volcano. I was like, Ooh. And I went and told somebody else, that's an active volcano. And they're like, no, it's not. This is how, <laughs> this is how Facebook works. <laughs> this is, yeah. We're all outraged yeah. like, when we find it. So somebody may have lied to me, and I dutifully wrote it down as truth. But no, I don't think, I don't generally think that there's um, much uh, a, of a cause for lying to me. But if I did, if somebody did, um, I, I think I'd, I don't know, it would depend on the lie and the person. But they wouldn't get away with it. <laughs> um, I would just like to say that I appreciate your sense of humor, especially when it comes to science. That's, it's, we've all enjoyed it, I'm sure. Um, so I'm actually a student going for a Bachelor of Science, and I was just going to ask you, um, yeah, uh, your advice on, in, in this day and age, especially for young students, yeah. um, it's, it's difficult because a lot of people tell you, you know, especially now, like just to veer away from science. And so can you give us some advice on um, why, why because science, you know? Uh, oh, God. Well, first of all, a, a, a career in science is, is you're always going to have an interesting life. You know, it's, it, it's, it's constantly shifting and changing, and you're always exploring new things. The other thing about science is that, you know, I remember in high school sort of you know, thinking about jobs in the future, you know, there was this, well, you could do something creative like the arts, or you could do science. But that's so, I mean, science is, it's so creative. I mean, think about designing an experiment or thinking about like trying to figure out how something works and how could you, how could you put that to the test and how could you, I mean, it, it's an unbelievably creative and challenging pursuit that I think would, would just never get old. So, Good for you for choosing that. And it's also, it's, you know, for the same reasons we were talking about before, so important um, that, that people keep going into science despite the political climate that we're in now. It's, I think it's more important than ever and more noble. So good on ya. Yeah, you'll never know where you'll find yourself. I mean, I was a studio art major, and so I joined the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, the path is strange, but always interesting. Hello, Mary. Hi. You mentioned earlier that when you uh, are performing interviews, you like to hang around, and you receive a lot more information on the second day. Could you analogize that to the second sniff of the stench? <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, interesting. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I think when people, when you go and you, you visit somebody, They've kind of prepared a lovely floral thing for you, mm. and they like go like, the, and, and it often takes the form of, "I'd like to show you my PowerPoint," and I don't want to see a PowerPoint. I, you know, I want to, I want to see the real gritty stuff. I want to see the real. Shit. So um, that is, oh, is a, should I not have said that? Too late. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's like pooping once you've uh, once uh, you've gone. Yeah, once you've gone, yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I'm looking for like the real stuff. Uh, and um, and that yeah, I think that's an excellent excellent analogy. <laughs> we have a we have a question up here. Hi, Mary. Thanks for coming. Hi. Um, I noticed that all the books are oriented towards people, and since we share the planet yes. with a lot of 1.5 million species, yes. have you ever thought about taking your stories or your comedy and featuring maybe something that's not human? Oh, I thought you were going to say trying to sell books to animals. No. no, no. <laughs> Well, with the last name Roach, it just resonated yeah. with my husband and I. Why not talk about maybe you know 90% of all the species on the planet are insects, and you have the last name Roach. Have you I ever know. thought about taking that tact? I have thought about that. I thought of doing an entire book on 
cockroaches because of my name. And because cockroaches end up in some interesting, I think the military's done like putting little cameras on them. And, um, I, I have thought about that. And um, there are a lot of insect, Dr. Tatiana's Guide to Insect Sex, isn't there that? There, there's Wicked Bugs. There's a, a lot of good, clever bug books out right now. There was a, Brooke Borrell, I think is her name, the bed bug book that came out recently. So it's a little bit of a crowded uh, field. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I, I have thought about it. I've also thought, I, I thought, I did a National Geographic story on, on a, a group of chimpanzees in, um, in Africa, savanna chimps, not rainforest chimps. And, and it was so interesting. I thought, okay, my next book is going to be about chimpanzees. But I realized in writing that article, it was for National Geographic, maybe 5,000 words, I realized uh, it, I, they're such, they're so, you just have to see them, their expressions and the things to try to describe them. I always felt like I was missing their charm and the magic of them. It almost wanted to be a film. Uh, and, and it's really hard to get a good quote from a chimp. <laughs> uh, it's how you ask the question. <laughs> Precisely. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I have thought about it, and I do think about it. I'd love to, like, some, yeah, some, if there was a story to tell that would allow me to step off and talk about, you know, and, and people who, like, the, the, in the 1800s and 1700s, the way that, that people studied animals was really interesting and different. And so I do think about that, yeah. Doug Stanton, I do. is, uh, Doug Stanton, tell me how much longer do we have for questions, wherever you are in your mythological location? <laughs> See how I did that? You are dismissed. No. <laughs> but sit, I can one conjure more. a Doug Stanton whenever <laughs> I want one. <laughs> I just want to say uh, before Doug says what no, I'm about to say. Let's let Eric go. Thank you. <laughs> what? I'll take it from here, Ben. It's okay. Eric, go ahead. Uh, Mary, I wondered if um, you could go back to your pre-Wesleyan oh, days. There you days. are. Ooh. I was wondering if you if you would go back if you could go back to your pre-Wesleyan days. Would you uh, would you pursue a career in science yourself? Do you think, or something mm. more technical? I have a bit of a short attention span. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, if I'd had um, if I had had a different biology teacher, like I had a physics teacher who really brought physics to life. He was funny. He's cute. I had a crush on him. Uh, he was pretty funny, and, he, and he, he just, everybody got it, and it was really interesting, and sort of, you could apply it to the real world, and I remembered a lot, like, I could so I plot an orbit. I, when I did Packing for Mars, I thought, my God, I remember all of, I remember all this. I, I get that, the whole, it's, it's, in, it's in my head, and if I'd had a biology teacher, I had a biology teacher who, who made biology boring. How do you do that? How do you do that? Um, so I, I could definitely have seen myself going, into science, um, if I'd had if I'd had a different teacher, yeah, for sure, and I, I think I would have been happy. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, it, it worked out okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, science's loss has been our gain, <laughs> <laughs> definitely tonight. This has been a really amazing, fun conversation. Really, thank you to the both of you for uh, so much enlightenment and, and laughter. These books are for sale in the lobby, and you'll take more questions, and you will give a, a free oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You will, yeah. bit of memorabilia to each yes, uh, customer. Yes, we have a whole bag here. Yep. Yeah, um, if, if you have to leave, you can still buy a book and just leave your name or the name of anyone you'd like to have it signed to, and you can pick it up at Horizon any time afterward. Just don't leave without one. You need right. one. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for coming. See you at Julia Glassier. All right, thank you.